Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Silmarillion Film Project. This is my, I'm Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor, joined, as always, by Marie and Nick, our head writers. Dave couldn't be with us here today. He, he still might pop in. You never quite know. Uh, but um, uh, but we are joined also by a special guest, uh, Ilana Mushin from Australia. Ilana, thank you for joining us. Really nice to be here. Yeah, good to have you. Ilana is the uh, author of our script for episode six of season six. Episode six, of course, is the song battle episode. So this is one I know this uh, is an episode that is on the short list of many uh, who have been anticipating, uh, uh, you know, this story in film film for a while. Uh, so we're looking forward to discussing that. Um, of course, Ilana, you also, as it happens, are the host of Ozmoot, which I wanted to talk about. Uh, our first regional moot down in Australia, which is with which we are kicking off our spring moot season uh, next month, January 27th to 29th. Um, Really excited. I can't wait to uh, get down there and visit you down there in, in, in Brisbane, Oana. That's going to be a lot of fun. It sure is. I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about it as well. And I know many, well, many, those of us who are coming to Osmoot are going to enjoy it. Yeah. And obviously people are coming from interstate, um, I know already, and I've been interacting with them. Uh, so uh, including one of our film film uh, regulars, Phil Menzies, our composer. So, That's it. Gonna uh, get to gonna get to hang out with Phil there as well. Yeah, can't yeah, wait for that. So, uh, it's uh, it's gonna be and, and the program's up now and it looks really really interesting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, no, I think it should be great. And uh, I wanted to emphasize for people who cannot make it all the way to Brisbane, Australia for this moot. Um, we are still broadcasting this. We're going we're gonna to be broadcasting this as a hybrid moot the way that all of our regional moots are. And our hybrid moots include recordings. Uh, uh, if you can't make it, like if, for instance, you find that a section that you want to attend happens to be at two o'clock in the morning uh, on the East Coast here in America. However, um, in addition, we're, uh, Alana, you guys have packed the program. We've got like a three-day program going on for for Osmood, which yeah. is uh, crazy huge. Like uh, the <clears throat> our first ever regional moot in uh, the Southern Hemisphere is going big. <laughs> this well, I year. thought if you were going to come, if you were going to come all the way, we should, <laughs> should like make it a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's 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 going to be great fun. So certainly for people who are. Um, uh, attending remotely, you will get uh, uh, your best regional moot value of the year uh, signing up for uh, for this one. So definitely wanted to uh, to recommend that to folks. I know with the uh, this is by far the most significant time change uh, we've had from you know the normal time frame in which uh, uh, in which we normally broadcast in which our mute, moots normally happen, um, but. Um, but it'll be worth it. And as I say, I wanted to remind people that that they will all be recorded and the recordings are available, but only to people who sign up for, uh, you know, digital remote attendance uh, at the moot. I'm so. glad you confirmed that that came up as a question yesterday, yep. which I yep. need to ask you that you've answered it. Thank you. <laughs> That's the plan. That's the plan. Um, but um, yeah, anyhow, so um, we are... Um, yeah, so it's very exciting. So uh, you can check out the schedule, I believe, is posted uh, for Osmoot. So if you go to our Osmoot page, it is or will be soon. I'm not 100% sure which, but in any case. Yeah, I'm not a, I haven't checked the actual website yet. I know it's been sent around to everybody who's yeah. registered for it, but it yeah. may not be up for people who okay. aren't yet Well, registered. pretty soon it will I be think open. Yeah. yeah, Yeah, exactly. So you'll be able to, you'll be able to see that. Um, so that's pretty exciting. So again, that's end of January. Um, 27th to 29th ish dates are, it's yeah. weird. Like it's, 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 I'm not even sure what dates to announce. Like, do we announce the dates that it'll be in Australia or the dates that it'll be in America? Yeah. Like it's, it's um, yeah. Yeah. It's a fair point. <laughs> but anyhow, you know, end of January, vaguely yeah. that last weekend of January uh, is when it's is when it's, it's going to be. Um, but anyway, that's going to be great fun. But anyway, let us get back into film film here. Our uh, 
Uh, here we're going to be we're going to be using the map. Of course, we have a major scene at the crossings of uh, of, of the Tagon up here. So we got uh, the journey from Nargothrond up across Tagon up to Tolsirian up here. So we've got the two crossings of the river. Uh, and meanwhile, uh, where is is Neverimon here? No, it's not labeled, but it's where the D of Doriath is. Right, this forest over here on this side, yeah. Okay, so this is where Kelgorm and Kurafin are, where they meet Luthien out here. Okay. Um. Okay. Cool. Anyhow, all right. So, episode one through five. So let me just remind myself of the flow here. We've got the necromancy. So. Both in episodes one and two, I, I know because I'm, I'm mentioning this. I know we're coming back to the Well of Souls and Necromancy here for the first time in a while because we've been away from that for some time. But we had that primarily, of course, the well, the establishment of the necromancy concept was happening in episode one. Um, the uh, it was existing like the Well of Souls was there in episode two, though it was less emphasized. The primary plot of episode two was the hunting of the outlaws in Dorthonian. Um, so it's really been since episode one that we had a strong emphasis on Sauron as necromancer, right? Correct. Um, he's been doing things with the wells of Well of Souls mm -hmm. from the first episode right but after he establishes that we don't really see him do anything in particular so they're there he's using them as a power source but there's not an active plan going on whereas in episode one of course he used them to take the tower as the ghost army essentially. right right and we established um this sort of uh growing tension and rivalry between Sauron and Thorin Gwethil. Was that episode one or two? So in episode one, she is the one showing him the necromancy stuff. Yeah. So she's considering herself very important. Then in episode two, she goes and takes over Dorothonian and roots out the outlaws like he told her to. So she's highly successful at that. So she's been doing a really great job and keeps asking him for access to the Well of Souls, and he keeps pushing back on that. Right. So she's, at this point, by this episode, getting a little bit frustrated that he's like, yeah, 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 I guess you go do your thing. And right. she's like, but no, 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 no. There was a thing we were supposed to be talking about and we were supposed to be working on. <laughs> Why am I not part of it? Right. So that <clears throat> tension is present in this episode. Because what we set up by having... Uh, Thurin Gwethil be a fallen Maya of Namo is that the ne necromancy is kind of her thing. Like this is, um, mm. she has a certain right to it or rather to look at it another way. He is kind of exploiting what she was able to show him and teach him. And so there's a certain justification of her feeling that this is really kind of her bag and she should be more heavily involved. Right. Right. Um, right. So like, so from her standpoint, it's almost like he, you know, turns himself into a giant werewolf and moves in on Draugluin's territory. You know, like I'm going to take over the wolf, uh, you know, the werewolf leading personally, uh, you know, and, and, and put you on the bench, Draugluin. Right. Um, that's kind of how Thorin Gwethel feels. I mean, like yes. the parallel to that. She, she feels a bit overlooked yeah. and a bit as if she's being pushed away. Yeah. Rather than, because not only is she in um, Maya of uh, Namo, but her whole deal the whole time has been she just loves secrets and finding out secrets and mm -hmm. getting to know the information, which makes her a great spy. Right. And Sauron has been very happy to use that talent of hers this whole time. But now she wants to know more about these souls and find their secrets. Right. And he's like, eh, you know, maybe not. Right. Not right now. Right. Maybe maybe another time. 
yeah. after we, you know, conquer Beleriand. Right. <laughs> and she's sitting here like, but. <laughs> right. Um, do we ha- do we have a sense? I'm sorry, I'm probably wandering away from our outline as usual. But um, do we have a sense that she is not only feeling like she is being deprived of her own, like he's taking her own tools and her own thing and, and using them himself and she's not getting what she deserves, but also that he's kind of, um, I don't know, to say he's not doing it right makes it sound really cheap and that's not exactly what I mean, but um, I mean, this is her, like, she's made for this. Like, this is what, I mean, this is her this is her area, right? This is her, you know, more it or less. Is, but she is corrupt. So yeah. her... It doesn't come across you... that way in this episode. I mean, sorry, yeah. Marie. No, I was just going to uh, say, yeah, her her interest here is not what Amaya of Dama is supposed to be No, doing. no, it wouldn't be. So well, she's already doing it wrong. So for her to turn to San and be like, hey, you're doing it wrong. It's right. Like, yeah, no, and... yeah, I... I don't mean in that sense, like she would be offended, like, oh, this is a this is a, an abomination. What you are doing, because uh, what she's doing is an abomination, too. Like the whole thing was an abomination from the start. So, no, it's not that exactly what I'm thinking, because, Ilana, I was thinking uh, forward to it uh, without too many spoilers, because we'll get there. Um, we see him. We do see him using it like when we last. This is really the second time we will have seen through the necromancer in action. Right. Mm. The first time was when he takes Tulsirian, but there we didn't actually see Thu in action so much. We mostly did, we saw it happening as if it were happening. Well, not spontaneously. Presumably somebody was directing it, but we saw the spirits. Right. Um, and people were interacting with the spirits. It was like, a, you know, a phenomenon. They may have been under his command, but we didn't see like through the necromancer in the midst of his like swirling clouds of necromantic power exerting his power on people right that's what we didn't he's see gotten, before he's gotten good at it by now exactly well. and 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 that that's that's just the the kind of impression that i had while while reading the script and I, and and that's what i was that's kind of what i'm thinking through here that we're seeing he's 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 made a sort of leap and i think that that will be perceptible to us we last saw him he was a total noob in the necromancy front back in episode one, just figuring out, hey, well, you know, this is a there's this this is a hot prospect, you know, for acquisition of personal power. In episode six, we are seeing him having mastered that power, or at least something close to I mastering. I think that it. was what I was trying to get at with that conversation that Thurin Grethel and Drag Lewin have, mm-hmm. uh, where Drag Lewin points out that Sauron clearly is using this stuff for his own advantage and yeah and yeah. Uh, and can do so and so on as well as what we see and so i think th- i think that's what i was getting at when i was asking about thorin gwethel thinking he's doing it wrong again not wrong in the sense of like that is ontologically wrong or morally wrong or something like that but rather um that's not what i had in mind like when i taught mm. you this trick I was not thinking that you were just going to take it to yourself as a way to like exert your personal power. I'm not hundred percent sure what I'm thinking. She was thinking it was. So, right? so, so there was a scene that I unilaterally cut, which we can put back in, which okay. was the final scene of the episode. Um, Nick smirking because he wanted me to put it back in, <laughs> <laughs> which was the which was an actual confrontation between Thur and Grethel and Sauron. Okay, uh, where this this could come up. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, when I got to it, I sort of felt the episode worked well, ending where it did with the court at Menegroth, rather than coming back yet again to, to that. But that would be a place to put an actual confrontation between them before we get to the episode seven sort of finale of that plot line yeah. um it, but i was kind of really just trying to show thurin Gwethel's attitude rather than her confronting sauron directly yeah because you know she can see what sauron's trying to do here and she's pissed about it well one thing that like to your point of he's doing it wrong he's kind of almost going against his own mission statement mm-hmm. you know his own mission statement being why destroy what you can cultivate and 
sure he's not destroying them but he's not really cultivating them either is he right you know he's being a little more ham-handed with them where yeah. she would prefer him to be more well, surgical which is his amplify. typical that's his typical right. mo yeah right. yeah exactly he's using it to amplify his power which is you know a thing we're going to see him do again mm -hmm. right um, i mean and that, that but, fits with what we were talking about about yeah. having the well of souls be like the alpha version of the ring of power right right um yes um but yeah as i recall and as always, my recollections are 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 are, are foggy. Um, but as I recall, she was primarily in it for like the information. Like we can we can we can learn stuff from them. We can we can make them into our We can we can increase our power our power through knowledge by getting right. the, the true like the the kind of pure concept of necromancy, right? That is divination by oh. the dead, right? Was what she was really interested in. We can get. We can we we can learn stuff that will be to our advantage this way, and then use that in clever ways and take advantage of it the way we do round here, um, right, rather than that... just use it to buff yourself in this you know mm. general way. Yeah, that's the part where her origin matters. Right, is that she's going to continue to see them as elven souls no matter what. Yes, as individuals. As yes beings mm. with their own wills and all of that whereas it's pretty clear by now that sauron's using them as batteries yes they're a power source exactly yeah. so he's not interested in their individual identities any longer yes that's not important to him exactly and so when i'm thinking about um like i i was kind of imagining thorin gwethel watching um I, this, it kind of came up because it was one of the things that was in my mind alana as i was reading the scene um, in part, I was kind of imagining Thorin Gwethel looking on here, and like, mm. what would she think about this performance? And and I and and what I was thinking was like her being like, that is so wrong. Not in the sense of like, oh, you shouldn't behave that way, but in the sense of like, I've, that's not what they're for. Like, you're you're. I, I've got reaction shots which mm -hmm. I can. Kind mm -hmm. of, yeah, I mean, I I had that. I I wanted to kind of more show Thorin Gwethel's reactions through that whole sequence of the song battle and so on as being not impressed at all yeah. in, uh, in, in what he's doing here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, he's, he's taking, that's the idea. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, um, um, yeah, I, I like, I like that. It, now I get, we don't have to be, I don't think we have to give too much. The audience does not absolutely need to know what Thorin Gwethel was thinking. Right. Mm. I mean, I don't think they absolutely need to know that. Um, her, in part because she's dying so soon, right. All we need is some kind of division and an excuse to put her in the wrong place at the right time <laughs> so that she gets taken out when the tower is destroyed. Um, and to have that not seem totally weird and, arbitrary like we're you know accidentally killing a major character you know uh without purpose um but we and don't we're not need putting her, her on a bus either which we're, is what? What we're doing it we're not putting her on a bus either which is what we're doing to die on well <laughs> not as badly as Tolkien did. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean and not in this episode. Tolkien just abandoned Tyron at the bus station. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I had had it more about Thurin Grethel reacting uh, with just with her expressions and so on, rather than actual lines. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's one of the reasons why I was um, um, I was thinking about that as we we're kind of looking through this, because I was I was looking back at the distance that it's been. I like the fact that we will show Sauron not only really kind of owning the through the necromancer thing. Right. You know, really having um, built up that persona having really established his authority, the authority which is given to him by Morgoth in episode one, right, as he's made, uh, you know, given command of this whole area. But um, 
to really show that he has been progressing as um, as time as time passes there. Um, yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah. So uh, uh, responding to uh, meow indeed from uh, Twitch here for a second, who was just saying, "I really want a proper narrative written about Sauron's persona, Sauron's perspective and thoughts throughout everything." Um, that's kind of film film. Basically, I mean, we've been saying for years that Sauron is our closet protagonist of the entirety of film film. He's like the one character whose arc will extend from season one to the final season uh, of uh, uh, of of film film. Um, unless we stretch the post War of the Ring denouement into an entire season, <laughs> of course, in which case we would have one Sauron free season um, in the whole lot. But um but yeah, I mean, it is one of the things uh, that we um, that we are very interested in is showing, trying to sh to really play the long game with Sauron's character and to to really to really illustrate that. So, um, anyhow, uh, okay. Last time, that is episode five. We had right Baron and Argothrond with Finrod and Luthien. Uh, in the tree. Okay. All right. The title of the episode, however, is Hound of Valinor. Uh, as we uh, have Huon take center stage here. Um, right. So our A plot um, is Baron and Finrod and company moving north and then getting captured by Sauron at the end. So we get that that storyline culminates in the song battle and the imprisonment. Um, the B-plot is Luthien uh, getting to Nargothrond and being captured by Kelgorm and Kur gently, relatively politely captured by Kelgorm and Kurufin uh, back in Nargothrond and the beginning of her relationship with Huon. And then, of course, we did have the... Uh, this, the two C plots being both the Thur Thurin uh subplot with Sauron that we were discussing, and uh, Thingol's reaction, we do get the delivery of the uh, uh, of the impertinent letter to Thingol from Kelgorm. Uh, <laughs> Gilgalad begging not to have to read the letter aloud was kind of fun. <laughs> really, sort of like that. Um, uh, I felt for him. <laughs> yes, it's hard. It's hard. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, so, first, let's talk about the A plot. Um, with focus, primarily, appreciate, Marie, the uh, song illustration for the uh, the battle <clears throat> scene. That's, uh, I think, it uh, really captures things here. Um Okay, um, so um, the biggest the biggest issue, right? The main thing that we should really begin with is the depiction of Finrod's um, the of Finrod's magic generally, right? And here, because I would want to include in this discussion both the disguise. Right, and then the song confrontation with Sauron there at the end. Um, explain? Can we explain how exactly we're suggesting the magic works? Like, it's... <laughs> how does it work? So, he so sings... In, in Middle-earth, yeah. Most magic is based in the meaning of the words and the will of the person speaking the words. Right. So it's an innate ability of the person performing the magic. Right. And they just say it and it is so kind of thing. I sang of leaves, of leaves of gold, and leaves of gold there grew. And yes. Sar I went with Sarah Man, your staff is broken. I was just going to say that. Yeah. yeah. That was so. That's why everything's in straight declaratives. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yes. So it's 
one of the one of the reasons I'm asking, <laughs> I'm starting with that question, is I'm thinking in, in both cases, there seems to be the nature of Finrod's magic seems to be partially, at least, principally with the disguise, and at least partially with the song battle about glamour that is about false appearance, well, right? Well, and of course, it's about Odyssey, isn't it? I mean, yeah, this, yeah, exactly. Well, like he's yeah. he's performing. What, so what's he, he performing? Fairy and drama. Right. He's yeah. he's he's um, doing a work of art which can deceive the appearers, which means. And of course, one of the questions that this raises, what is that? Is that is it the viewer that's being affected or is it the thing that's being affected? And this seems to be raised this is an issue that seemed to be raised by the way that the experience like of Baron himself as he's being disguised. Mm. He doesn't look like an orc to himself, but he looks like yeah, an orc to them. So he's not changed. It's how other see him that's changed. So this the spell that Finrod is casting is not actually like when does I'm just so just isolating Baron for a second. Baron is disguised, but Baron is not changed by the magic. Everyone else who looks at Baron is changed by the magic. That's how we're imagining that happening. Yep. Correct. Um, so the word glamour is used specifically yes. to show that this is not a work of transformation. It's a deception or a fairy and drama where yeah. Finron has given his companions new appearances. So anyone who looks at them will perceive orcs, but that's not, they didn't turn into orcs. Right. Right. Mm. Um, I suppose Okay, hang on a second. I'll try to do this very briefly, but I suppose I should define fairy and drama as not less than 100% of the audience might be familiar with that. The concept is really simple. Essentially, the basic concept is Tolkien says, you know, an artist creates a kind of illusion, right? Like when an artist tells a story and you get drawn into the story and you invest it with secondary belief, a re the better the artist is, the more fully you'll be drawn into the story uh, and the closer you will be to like mistaking it for reality, right? For like, like you're like immersed in the story. Um, his argument is that in fairy, like an elf is able to do that so thoroughly that you will actually mistake it for the real world. So when, when, when you are being... Uh, when you are the target, when you are the audience of elf art, artistry, um, you will be, uh, that's like, you know, the full virtual reality experience rather than merely conjuring those images in your own mind as under the, you know, in influence and direction of the artist. Um, so that's, that's the concept of fairy and drama. Fairy and drama is a work of art that is performed, but which is so convincing and which is so powerful that a mortal who views it mistakes it for reality. And so that's the concept of um, that's how the illusion is done. Then it's basically an artistic performance on Finrod's part. Right. We're differentiating this from the later scenario where Luthien and Baron will transform into Drogluin mm -hmm. and Theron Gwethel. Yeah. So this is, this is just a glamour and he's just fooling orcs with it. The implication is that when he's taken before Sauron, Sauron is aware that there's something funny about these orcs. <laughs> like, yeah, he's pretty clear they're not orcs. They're exactly. Not he yeah, knows he they're can, not orcs. Yeah. He can, he can pick up pretty clearly that they're not, and he's sort of playing with them to start with. Um, and I, I didn't, I mean, Finrod. Finrod, unlike Luthien, is a straight-up elf. I mean, he doesn't have anything other than his elfness to work with, as mighty as that might be, as right. elves go. So, yeah. Right, right. Um, yeah, so the interesting... No, so you're right. I mean, we will get the corresponding scene with the werewolf pelt and uh, the cloak of, of Thur and Gwethil. Um, but, of course, the immediate thing is the song battle, with Finrod and Sauron, which also consists of what will look similar. That is, Finrod sings, images appear, right? 
And then, of course, it is confirmed at the end that those images were always untrue or illusory. Like, that, there's... He got out, out very in a yeah, sense. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think... So, I think the thing that I liked best about how it happened in the script is the fact that a viewer, I think, would be left with a question of, so what actually happened? You know, I'm confused about what actually happened. And I feel like if a viewer at the end says, I'm confused about what actually happened, that's probably a good place for them to be. <laughs> like, I, I, I'm not sure we, I'm not sure that's not where we want them is asking what, what actually happened there. Um, because of course within, so let's, 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 let's recap. Do you want me to recap based on what I got from it? Or, 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 or would you guys like to recap? Go ahead. Okay. All right. So they the Sauron and Finrod kind of go back and forth. There's like an initial sort of skirmish between the two of them, right? And then Finrod gets a whole bunch of lines in a row and where he's talking about freedom and escape uh, and trust. And while he's doing that, we get it's kind of um, it's kind of Baron's point of view. Right. Throughout the story. So from Baron's point of view, he is like they are leaving the room, the throne room. They're they're escaping, actually escaping from Sauron's throne room. And they leave Sauron behind and Finrod is in the rear. And uh, there is like some he's singing about Valinor. And when he sings about Valinor, we, he, you know, Baron sees the images of the trees and, 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 and then of the sun and moon. And he's seeing the uh, the 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 coastline by Aqualande, right? He's seeing the waves on the shore um, of, uh, of, of Valinor. Um, but while he's seeing all these, he's also, he's, he's aware of kind of two, what seemed to him to be two sort of visual realities, right? One are these images that Finrod is evoking in his song, but the other, he's also seeing his surroundings. Like they're, they're coming to the bridge and they're going to escape the Isle of Tal Sirion, even to the point where he's drawing his sword and he's fighting with, uh, with orc guards at the gate. So it looks like escape is actually occurring and they're like, you know, this close to making it into the clear, crossing the bridge and, and this becoming a chase scene instead of an escape scene. But as far as like, we are going to escape from Sauron's presence and the throne room, that looks like that has definitely happened. The only question is whether they get, are they're going to get across the bridge. Um, Sauron strikes back at this point and he starts talking about the betrayal. And so we get the blood and the water and the burning ships and the sort of counter images that he uh, that he sort of throws at Finrod to counter his uh, Finrod's images uh, and memories. By the way, I loved the moment when uh, Inglor joins in. Right. And we get the the like, you know. Uh, Caliquendi unite moment, right? You know, in opposition to Sauron, that was really fun. Um, uh, anyway, so so they're 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 they looks looks like they're about to go, and then we, in the end, we come to this like sort of seesaw back and forth of the fundamental concept, right? Of um, you know, like trust and forgiveness versus you know betrayal and treachery, and um, and then and and in the end, of course as we all knew, Sauron wins, right? Sauron overcomes them. And when he overcomes Finrod, and when Finrod falls, Baron sees that they're actually still in the throne room. And there's Finrod yeah. now down on his face on the ground, chained um, in front of Sauron, leading then to the question, so wait, like, did they ever actually, like, did they leave and were brought, did they, 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 ne they never left in the first place, right? That it was all, uh, that was all illusions. So th this is, of course, what I mean when I say there, there, I think would be some real question about like what, okay. if it were just there, a matter of the images. Yeah, yeah, go, there, go there ahead, go a, ahead. There is a point where you could see where, so um, th there's a point where Sauron, comes in i think I, f I pictured this as a fight in four rounds mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. so the first one is just sauron saying you're revealed and trying yep. to get their disguise off and that's when finrod comes back with a counter punch right uh, there's no and then sauron tries to go 
I'm going to dominate your will. Yeah. Which is different from I'm going to strip your disguise. Right. Uh, and then Finrod comes back with the counter to that. And so at that point, Sauron says they're, they're enchained. I, don't, I actually don't have it open in front of me, so I can't remember exactly what the lyric is. But And, and so now they, they appear to be in chains, and that's when Finrod comes back. And that's the kind of point at which the reality might diverge. Right. So they mm -hmm. might have been just in chains from that point. Uh, um, I mean, I'm leaving it open, but that right. is a point right. where a viewer might go, okay, it was real up until that point. Right. And then it looked like Finrod was able to, to, uh, <clears throat> to resist, to resist that, uh, that spell, uh, right. and and in fact gain an upper hand for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But uh, of course, that was uh, never going to happen. Against the Lord of Tolengor Hoth, there can be no victory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, uh, so one more episode. Right. One yeah. more episode. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think that Finrod's yeah. Finrod's um, you know, and it's kind of a good and noble attempt to kind of evoke Valinor and all the wonder of the world and all the all, all the great stuff. But he makes a fatal error in going to his own personal memories. Um and I think that's the point where Sauron that that you can that's where I've got Sauron kind of you know smiling to himself at that point because he's like aha uh, I know how to, I know how to count this um, in because you're not even sure if he knows who Finrod is at this point now he certainly knows who Finrod is at this point or at least uh, he and, knows that he's one of the Noldor and yeah, he and knows all about memory. the Noldor Kryptonite yeah yeah and uh, and so. Uh, you know, at the very point where, like, Baron is now completely immersed in the Ferian drama, he thinks he's actually on the beach and you right. know, he's seeing the whole thing and immersed in it. And now we're in Finrod's personal memories of his joy, and that's what Sauron turns on him. Yeah. So uh, that's how I was imagining that went. So, okay. So here's my... I don't know that this is necessarily a problem. Like, I don't know. But here's my here's my issue. I feel like there's a line, right? Therian drama, at the end of the day, is illusion. I mean, it's it's not... It's a secondary world so convincing you mistake it for the primary world, but it's not a primary world change. Um, but, of course, there is magic, like when Galadriel sings of trees of gold and trees of gold and leaves of gold there grew, like they're actual leaves. It's not an illusion, right? Like they're they're um you can affect things in the primary like effect of in things in the primary world is a thing mm. that happens, right? And it's not the same thing. It's it's like maybe related to, but it's not the same thing as fairy and drama itself. Um I guess here's a question that I, I'm, I'm sort of imagining. I, so that the issue that I'm trying to describe here is a confusion that I can imagine a viewer having. I think that there is there are salutary and unsalutary confusions that could occur here. Um, if there is some confusion between appearance and reality, that could be good. I, 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 I kind of like that. But... Here's the thing I think we wouldn't want people to be confused about. Finrod, Finrod's power has to be seen to extend beyond mere only illusion, right? Um, when he's speaking against Sauron, um, you know, when Sauron is singing about chains and Finrod is singing about the breaking of chains, that's not just like, I'm going to, create an illusion that the chains are broken. Like there are some real chains, whether they're metal chains or whether they're chains of will, there are real chains involved here, which need actually to be broken, right? That is the battle between Sauron and Finrod is at least in part, if not primarily being played out in the primary world and not just a matter of pictures, not just a matter of illusions. It's associated with those pictures, but there is definitely a primary. 
here here's my here's like a one way to state the probably clumsily my concern about how we might confuse viewers here. If we give them the impression that Finrod's power is just all about illusion, then what his what he's trying to do with Sauron could look like mere trickery. Like what Finrod was trying to do was conjure up an illusion that would deceive Sauron somehow, uh, like conceal them and enable them to escape by tricking him. And it's not just about trickery. It's about his will versus Sauron's will. Right. Um, and but it's hard because there is illusion involved and it begins with illusion. That is the orc disguise illusion that he ha which is manifestly illus illusory. And so that's that's right. That's appropriate to do it that way. And the whole initial uh, frame of their contest is Sauron trying to penetrate those, you know, to, to reveal them. You know, one, as you were saying, in round one. Right. And Finrod trying to conceal them and maintain that illusion. So the the first sort of battleground, the first uh, conflict between Sauron and Finrod is the one trying to maintain the illusion and the other trying to shatter the illusion, which footnote, there's some irony there, right? As it's like Sauron who is trying to reveal truth and Finrod who is trying to maintain a lie, <laughs> right? So there's, yeah. there's, there's, there's definitely irony in that moment, right? But anyhow, okay, so... That's where it begins, but I don't think that's where it ends. Like, there's more to it than that. Like, it kind of moves to another level where they really are warring in the primary world. And I want to make sure, like, are we going to, uh, would we be able to bring viewers along yeah. there to that step? That's my, that's, that's my big concern. Okay. So I agree that we wouldn't want this to be, it was all a dream. Yes. At mm. the end of it. Like, yes. there has to be a real element to it. The question is, which is more powerful? Finrod falling down at the gate or partway onto the bridge or whatever. Right. And them being surrounded and dragged back into the tower as prisoners. Or the song ends, the illusion falls away, and he's in the throne room on the floor. Like, which is a more powerful ending to the song battle? Mm -hmm. because the we song can battle ends with them at the gate so we right. can we can do stuff there if need be i'm sorry i agree with yeah. you right? no, yeah. but the reason i say that is because there is a very easy way to fix any potential misunderstanding there which is baron was fighting real orcs with a real sword the whole time and mm. then they're rounded up and dragged in as prisoners and they lost at the end like we can definitely do that mm. but we lose some element of the song battle being what it was all about. Yeah. If they're rounded up by guards at the end. Yeah. Yes. So I think the solution here is in the cinematography uh, and the way in which we move from the gate to back to the throne room um, to have that have a sense of motion rather than just the glamour falls away and they're back on the throne right the to give the viewer a sense that they've moved um also another way another an additional thing that you can ha do to handle this is to have just a shot or two of the carnage on the bridge mm -hmm. mm. that actually took place right mm to demonstrate that Sauron didn't just force down Finrod's magic. He actually magically trans, he sang into existence their being back in the throne room under his power. Right. Right. Yeah, we do. I, I do think that of, of primary importance here is to make sure that the ultimate victory is obviously Sauron's himself and not Maria. I think this is what you were talking about, right? If we don't want the, like they've successfully escaped from the power of Sauron, but Oh, unfortunately they get caught by a bunch of orc guards uh, and recaptured yeah. like that. That was definitely what we don't want. We want it to be very clear that it is, it's not just Sauron that recaptures them, but that they have they have simply failed to escape from Sauron at all. And so that's for that reason, I can see the like boomeranging them back or, you know, 
rubber banding them back to the throne room is attractive for that reason. Or a cat playing with a mouse. Right. I mean, it's that right. sort of right. thing which... The kind you know, of distant to Bilbo memory. Yeah. <laughs> so we, I think that comparison or what the spider does with the fly or right. whatever. Right, right. Uh, um, you know, that's been sour on before, hasn't it? <laughs> you know, here's, here's, uh, a, here's a suggestion that might... Um, that might just be cheesy, but... It's what occurred to me when I was reading it. What if um, they're on the bridge and they're fighting their way out and then they, okay, it looks like they, they get to the other side of the bridge and Sauron is just, is there. Sauron is standing that there. That was the original mm -hmm. intent, I believe, if I recall yeah. correctly. Sauron is just standing there on the other side of the bridge. Like It could be an illusion of Sauron. Like, that's fine. Mm. But that would be his yeah, victory, too, cool. right? But Sauron is standing. They can't. They they think they've escaped Sauron, because that's the sense that it get when they were backing away. One of the things that I was feeling when I was responding to that was this sense of tension of like they're they're actually escaping from Sauron. Like they're leaving Sauron behind. I was like, how even is the song battle going to continue? Right. I mean, is Sauron piping it in through the PA system? You know, as as they're as they're getting away. Right. I mean, like that is there was. I was getting the sense. Um, of like it seemed like they were in the process of escaping from Sauron, right? If when it looks like they've almost escaped, Sauron is standing there facing them, it will show they they never actually came close to escaping from Sauron, and he was just to by even by letting them get to the bridge, he's just been toying with them yeah. all along. Um, they are still completely within his power, and when they see when he reveals himself at the end, and then. They, you know, Finrod is overcome and falls on his face, and 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 they be they are chained. Um, the the chains could be real chains that are, you know, sung into being by Sauron's song, basically. Um, mm. so this would enable their escape attempt to be real. It would show that Finrod. One way, one of the challenges of depicting this and there are many challenges of depicting this scene visually but one of them is how do you make it clear that Finrod did reasonably well but still lost right we don't want to make it because I don't think it's true that Sauron just squashed Finrod like a bug right mm. it was it was this was you know this this fight went 12 rounds right I mean it was it was a pretty right. close fight yes. um and Split decision yeah, yeah yeah exactly um but um and so Unlike that, but, the fight between Sauron and Luthien, which is clearly, <laughs> which is yes, right, right, which is more like a, more like a Tyson fight from the eighties, um, yes, <laughs> um, uh, but uh, anyhow, yeah, yeah. So um, yes, the having them actually like physically, they actually really did get out of the throne room. They actually really did get to the gate. Conveys the fact that like. So, conveys Finrod did well, right? Like there, there was real progress towards escape that was made when Finrod was on a roll in the, you know, in the, in the middle there. Um, but Sauron's appearing not from behind, right? Not overtaking them, right? But Sauron uh, appearing in front of them at the end would convey clearly that like, yeah, actually, nah, I, I, I had this the whole time. Oh. I quite like that because the last image you have of them is Baron assisting Finrod over the bridge because Finrod is absolutely spent at yeah. that point. Yeah. Uh, and so if if then they look up and there's Sauron, that would work. Yeah, yeah. And and then again, and then you get the final image. So it doesn't have to be in the throne room. I know there's that line, Finrod fell before the throne, right? Is <laughs> It, we want to preserve the concept of that. If Sauron is standing at the bridge and Finrod falls on his face at in his front feet, of Sauron, yeah. I, I think we got the, the idea across. Yeah, yeah. And Except we, don't, we, we lose Thurin Gwethel and Draglun's re reaction. To mm -hmm. We, we could still put them in a Statler and Waldorf-esque position watching <laughs> the end. It could uh, be standing yeah. on the... On the 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 battlements, yeah, of looking the, down of yeah. the keep, yeah. okay. of the That's keep fine. itself, they'd be able to I see everything there. Yeah. That is an important point. To get. Um, which actually hang on a second that's kind of good because we're going to yeah. want the vantage from the battlements in the next episode yes right? that exact spot yeah that exact spot yeah that was good. okay that's um, 
Right. So that'll anticipate episode seven. And then having Sauron at the gate kind of anticipates the end or uh, the escape from Ang Band with Karkaroth waiting for them. Yes. So it, yeah, we can get a multiple uh, a multiple it, yeah. anticipation there. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. And, yeah. 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 And even the way that it even in Sauron's conflict with Luthien, we can get we can build some echoes there of uh, of that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so mm -hmm. I, I. That also would be if they hadn't if they being the viewers, if the viewers haven't yet gotten that there is there's more than illusion going on here. Um, them falling like. Finrod falling at Sauron's feet and Baron suddenly finding himself chained with real chains would make it really clear, I think, that there's more than illusion going on here. Or, you know, maybe there would be internet debates about whether or not the chains that were chaining them were real chains or whether they were just illusory chains. But one way or the other, their wills have been overcome by Sauron, whether it is, you know, overcome in the sense of his illusion is so thorough that they cannot free themselves from the chains that don't really exist or whether they're under his power in the sense that he did in fact, you know, conjure chains, uh, through his will and, and, and force them actually to be chained one way or the other. I, I think that would accomplish what, um, mm. yeah. Yeah. I had the chains tinged with a bit of red. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and th that, that coming from yeah. the way that his, like the necromantic mist, power of Sauron was kind of encroaching around the edges all the way through. Um, it, it sets that up nicely, right? So, I mean, again, it can look like they're escaping it, right? You know, it looks like the, you know, the, the, I don't know what, like a, like a fire that they're escaping or something like that. Like they're, the, they're going to get out of the range of his necromantic power as we believe they're leaving Sauron further and further behind. You know, he's still standing like a doofus back in the throne room and they're almost out, you know, the, across the bridge. Um, and then only to find then, you know, those mists, you know, swirling around Sauron again. And then, you know, connecting those mists to the chains, I think is, is good. Chains, chains are important, right? It's Lay of Lathian, for crying out loud, right? Imprisonment is, uh, you know, and and uh, escape from uh, from bondage is our theme, right? So the chains are important, um, and connecting those chains with Sauron's necromancy explicitly um, is uh, is important there. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and then those chains can be the kind that Finrod busts out of to right. save Baron. Yes. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which actually, people who wanted to debate whether those chains were were metal chains or whether those chains were chains of will could carry on debating them when debating that when <laughs> Finrod breaks them, right? As again, one way or another, that is the successful assertion of his will over the will of Sauron, whether it's overcoming the metallic bonds uh, that are holding him to the wall or whether it's overcoming the will of Sauron, which is holding him to the wall. Um, but yeah. are there covalent bonds? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> what kind of bond are they? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I do think that having it at least be open to interpretation that it is the will of Sauron helps kind of mitigate the why does Finrod not do that earlier yes. while his friends are dying screaming in the the next chamber I mean we, we've gone through a lot to get the um, to make sure that the image uh, the, that the structure ameliorates that as well but yeah, uh, I think that having the his his bonds be magically uh, enhanced at the very least. Right. Helps right. that as well. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I hear um, Evan on YouTube is uh, a little bit sad that we're losing the OMG. They're still in the throne room after all twist at the end, which I admit I, is, is fun. I mean, I, I like that at the end. Um, I'm just thinking of like costs, costs and benefits, you know, it's because again, the thing, I liked it for like five seconds. And then the more I thought about it, the more like difficulties I had with it, 
you know, exactly, uh, you know, the kind I was describing. Like, so in particular, more specifically, the problem I had was, so wait, so what was happening? What was real? What yeah. was real? What was real? Was Finrod creating an illusion of them esca- in which who, which who was he trying to fool? Like it wasn't, obviously it wasn't fooling sound. Was, was Finrod just creating an illusion to make the rest of them like Baron feel better? <laughs> like to think that they're escaping <laughs> when they weren't actually escaping? In which case, like, you know, like, so that was, that was, that was, that was the hard thing, you know, for me, mm-hmm. uh, uh, for me is that at the end I'm like, it seemed to undermine the idea that Finrod had been doing well at any point, you know? I mean, honestly, I, I feel that if Sauron met them at the bridge, sang his bit, and then they went back to the throne room, I feel like that would... I, I feel like that could also work, but, I mean, if it's if it's confusing, oh. it's confusing. You know, like, <laughs> well, and, and as I say, to me, it's about managing confusion to some right. extent. I mean, right. th- this this should be a little bit trippy. I mean, it, it, it is. There's um, things are being tampered with here that are not normally being tampered with overtly in the way that we're seeing here. This is a very unusual scene in Tolkien's um, yes, stories. Well, uh, I'll, I'll revise yeah. it and we'll see what it, see what you think. Um. Yeah, but um, but I don't. I certainly don't want to lose the magical element of it. Like I don't want to turn this into merely, you know, a chase scene, which you know, in which magic is being used as a, you know, an assist. The magic is the chase. Magic is the chase. Exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. If. Yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to think. Of, I'm trying to think of how we could have it both ways. Um, well, but, that's why I was saying, like, you, I mean, you could have, a, you know, a, as long as Sauron is physically there at the other end of the bridge. Yeah. And then they are. Rubber band effect. They, rubber band they are effect. rubber band and we visibly. Yeah, the camera gives us the f- sensation of motion. Um, I don't think that we have, as especially if we have evidence, as I said after, um, of there having been a fight at the right. bridge, so they physically were there. Right. Yeah, and um, if yes, if what we're positing happens is that the near escape physically happened. Yes. Their recapture physically happens and then they are physically like teleported back to the, uh, you know, transported back. Or maybe it's just even they're hauled back, but we skip the hauling. Right. The next thing they're aware of is being back in the throne room. Um, I don't know. I I don't know that it's necessary. I think we're going to we will lose the twist even if we try to do it. Yeah, if we're going to put them back in the throne room, we have to suggest to the viewer how they got there. We don't have to show them yeah. being brought back in. But if it's magic, then we need to at least show some effect that it's going right. to be a rubber band magic effect. If it's physically being dragged, we need to see them being rounded up in chains. Like, yeah. something has to suggest I'm, this is what I'm happened I'm starting to them. feel like we don't want to do... We don't. I mean, if Sauron is there at the gate... Or on mm-hmm. the bridge, and if Thurin Grathlin and Drag Lewin are up on the battlements watching it at that point, I don't think we need to go back to the throne room at all. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. do want it clear that when Sauron is standing there and Finrod falls and they're all chained, it, that it's game over at that point. Right. Like there's exactly. there's nothing further can, that needs to happen. We can use the, the Finrod falls before the throne. We can use the throne metonymically. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's <laughs> that's that's the idea. He falls before the metonymic throne. Out. Is exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know, the metonymic throne is kind of an awesome title. <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> like that would, Hound of the Hound of Hound of Valinor is a better title. I'm just saying the metonymic throne is kind of a fun title. I, I, I understand. Um, fun, but not better. Yes. Fun, but not I, better. I, yes. Agree. I'll give Agree. you that. Yeah, I, I, I quite like Hound of Valinor. Uh, me too. Me too. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, 
so yeah, I think that would, I think that that would be, because there's another thing I was going to add about, the, oh, um, one of the things that also is accomplished here, we haven't really seen, I'm coming back, Nick, I'm coming back to what you were saying about Sauron's MO, right? Not only has his MO been not to destroy, but to manipulate, right? Um, but also, um, brains over brawn has been his MO as well, as right. has been repeatedly contrasted uh, with Gothmog. Um, we've never really seen Sauron just cut loose with personal power over someone. But we've never we've never seen him just beat somebody in an arm wrestling match. Right. Physically or metaphysically, which he's just done. And this whole image of Sauron just standing there, it revealed in his power and his enemies helpless at his feet. This is a new look for Sauron. We've never really had him here before, have we? Um, he's the no. manipulator, the deceiver. Like, I mean, think mm. back, for instance, to how we had Sauron with, with um, Edelos. And, uh, mm. you know, I mean, like that was... Sauron exerting his power over somebody, but it was never a uh, like, and now you shall grovel before me, worms. Like Morgoth has been that, right? Yeah, the closest he came was back um, at the end of season three when he stops Mithras. Okay, right. And Mithras's entire army is killed by trolls. Yes. Um, so that's kind of a, you're going to stand right there because I'm going to force you to. All your guys are going to die because I orchestrated it. And I'm just going to stand here and gloat. Okay. So, so there he basically, he does put my Mithros into like a spiritual arm lock, right? Yes. yes. Uh, and capture yes. him, um, yes. which is still a little bit it's less. It's a song battle. It's a song battle situation. He uses yeah. his voice and yeah. Yeah. Mithros. Except unlike Mithros Finra, is no competition in this. Exactly. Area. That's yeah. the thing is Mithros is like, wait, what just happened? Right. <laughs> Where's Finrod fights back? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's so there is a par we have established a parallel to this, but it's still even it's even, rare. This is not a typical thing for Sauron and, and like he's I said, moving he's moving his MO. I mean we this uh -huh. is the yeah. point of this yeah. for well, him is he's he's yeah. breaking loose from Morgoth. That's know, what I mean. I, I have to admit, I'm kind of thinking about this from the perspective of our evil Statler and Waldorf up on the battlements, right? Um, <laughs> like, uh, this is this is a new look. Even to them, this is a new look for Sauron. Yeah. Like, jeez, I didn't know. Who, right. Well, he's, he's juiced up, right? Exactly. Like, exactly. Like, like, like did you know he could do that? <laughs> Holy cow. You know? <laughs> yeah. It's like when Bane pushes the button <laughs> and, the and, and, you know, the, the venom gets pumped into his veins. Right. Right, right. For people who just watched the Christopher Nolan trilogy, that's not in there. That's just, that's real Bane. <laughs> that's real Bane, right. It's, um, um, it, yeah, it's, it, it, Drag Lewin's really impressed, actually. Yes, yes. Yeah. And, um, and Thorin Gwethel would feel threatened, right? Because it's not just, I think it would be interesting with Thorin Gwethel and again, here's, here's me going back to harp on Thurin Grethel again. If she is not just envious, if she's not just... We don't want her merely sulking, right? I thought I yeah. was supposed to get some of the necromantic power. You know, oh, like, yeah. we don't want it to sound like that, right? Um, if instead she's kind of scared, basically. Yeah. yeah. She's right? concerned. Like, yeah, like, Before. well, crap, he is out of control now. Like I, you know, um, I'm not going to be able to manage this. Yes, I won't be. It, 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 That's she exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, she there. probably in, if, if we think of like, how has this partnership been to Thorin Gwethel? Right. She's not just like, <clears throat> oh, I think Sauron is a complete dreamboat and he's my number one guy and I'll do anything for him. Like that is not her M.O. Um, she's a bad guy. She doesn't do this out of devotion. Um but she does this because they work well together, right? Their MOs are similar. So she, you know, he is, uh, uh, he is the best potential partner to give her full scope to her abilities. Right. And she thinks she can manipulate him. She, you know, at the end of the day, she thinks that she can steer things. It's, yeah. I, I think it's gotta be what she's thinking. Right. 
Um, and so now she has got to be, uh, um, she has got to be concerned that this is not going to pan out. This, this is not going to pan out for her. And then in the end, she's going to be the more frustrated because she gave him the secret, which has led to him basically getting out of her control. Um, and so this is another thing that would motivate her to attempt to undermine him by trying to take control of the well of souls, um, and take back the necromantic power from him, not only to like get her rights or whatever, but to, um, to make her move against him by depriving him of this newfound power and using it for herself. Um, to kind of balance things back out again, right? Because yes, he's always been stronger than her, but I don't think to this extent. No, this is, yeah. Yeah. Um, she has been his his right hand person in part because right. they're 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 relatively closely balanced. She's not just a henchman. Right. It's been. it's not like Sauron and the Witch King, for example. Right. And the Witch King is a powerful dude, right? But it's not even right. there's no comparison yeah. between the, I mean, Sauron at the height of his power and the Witch King. Yeah. And quite honestly, Sauron. Well, I guess you couldn't say that Sauron at the height. <laughs> of his power because he has certainly <laughs> decayed by then <laughs> when is Sauron at the height of his power exactly yeah, we're we're right. starting. Mm, I think we're not yet there. no we're not there yet second age he's gonna hit his stride um, right because it's got to be after the ring but by then he's already okay Sauron once Sauron plus ring is at the height of very very top of his game right but he's now created for himself a vulnerability right in yeah. order to so, reach that so this is a kind of you know first pass at that i mean he's, he's doing something to amplify his power but he's again well he has created that. a vulnerability for himself if he had not done this it is possible that he may have been able to withstand luthien at the you know at the um I think we don't know the counter. If I had to vote for the moment in which Sauron is at the height of his power, it would be five minutes before our Farazan steps onto the shores of Valinor. Mm -hmm. Like that moment when Sauron (laughs) is cackling maniacally back in Numenor, thinking that he's won. I think that's the moment. Because even in the Battle of the Last Alliance, he's post Numenor. Like, Numenor, that that hurt, (laughs) right? The whole, like, I got sucked down to the abyss. Like, he survives that, but it's... um, That was a a diminishment of him. Clearly, clearly, you know, and so, yeah, I think think that's got to be, that's got to be the moment, unless you're going to argue, which I, I could imagine an argument that says he's at the height of his power uh, the morning he, like, when he wakes up on the morning that he makes the ring the one ring and that while from then it's on, all well yeah. it's all his own in while it's power. all his own right before yeah. he disperses yeah. himself into the one ring um but i agree with nick the whole point oh. with the one ring is that it makes him strike gives him a vulnerability but it does make him more powerful so i think it's hard at the end of the day to say that he was really stronger if he was then he wouldn't have done it right i mean well, yeah. you um, don't you don't make that the, trade for nothing the whole point with theron guethel though is whether or not she was an equal to Sauron in strength, because we've never shown her to be yes. his equal in that manner. It's that mentally she can keep up with him. Yes. And most of the denizens of Angband cannot. Right. I mean, the Balrogs are kind of dumb. Yes. And some of the other creatures in there are as well. So Sauron hasn't had a lot of people to talk to that he viewed as his equals and had any interest in talking to. Yes. So Theron Gwethel was the one person that was mentally at a level that he considered, you know, on par with himself. Yeah. And that it, she was worth talking to. Yes. Yes. That, that, of course, really, like, that fascinates me to think of it because, like, what characters are Sauron's intellectual equals? Right? Finrod. Like, <laughs> uh, in some respects yeah. yeah but not in not in all respects though no but 
Finrod is also someone Sauron would enjoy talking to outside of the song battle, I yes. think. Oh, That's yeah. what I think is so fascinating about this, that, that Finrod is like the thinker. That he, and, you know, Obviously, there's a huge divergence the philosopher, between him. Yes. And, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, there's a, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a but, certain likeness there. But I'm talking about like, like cold intellect. Right. Mm. Like, you know, like, it's uh, right. That's a really interesting question. Uh, yeah, because well, I mean, Kurufin. I would say mm. I, I think it's going to have to be Feanor because Kurufin is just the scheming side, and Mytheros is just the tactical side. Mm -hmm. Right. But Feanor presumably had both. Right. Yep. Yeah. And yep. Sauron would have found that really interesting and compelling if, oh look, they had ever met. You, well, like you get the sense that Denethor imagines himself as Sauron's intellectual equal. Yes. Maybe not in power, but in intellect. He, right. he mm. believes himself to be, but he seems to be deceived. He's not. Yeah. In that yeah. regard. Yeah. You know, same with Sauron. I mean, Gandalf probably is the only person Gan left in Middle Earth who's. Intellectually, like that isn't really I his know. bag. It's really not. Yeah. Maybe Gandalf Elrond. Just... Yeah. Uh. <laughs> we were just talking about this. I know, I know. I We we decided that, that Elrond is, is playing chess with the world in third age in the third age, the late third age. Um so but anyway. from that point of view, yeah, he would be similar to Sauron. And Gandalf's comment about weighing all things to a nicety in his scales means that that's how Gandalf thinks of Sauron's mind. Yes. yes. So whoever's his equal would just more intuitively do that and not be like, oh, yes, it's this weird thing where he's just calculating everything out. Right. <laughs> well, um, right. Uh, at, at the risk of, you know, inviting the wrath of everyone, I mean, Galadriel's an obvious person as well. Well, I was thinking about Galadriel as well. Yeah. I, I don't think she's necessary. Well, she's wise. Yeah. yeah. Which is the but word that Gandalf uses about Sauron. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, Galadriel's that he's very... also scheming and manipulative. Yes, 100%. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yes. She, she does say to Frodo that she perceives his mind and, you know, she's mm -hmm. able to... Understand yeah, but she also says to Aragorn, here, put on these nice elf clothes and go hang out with my granddaughter. She's <laughs> yeah. over there in that glade. <laughs> yeah. So, like, that was a choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, and the whole temptation scene, not her temptation, but when she tempts the company on their first yes. meeting yeah. is mm. not un Sauron like wholly. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I think one could easily say that if he has in this respect um, and, and this is actually to me a kind of an interesting thing with what we've done in film film is that um if in the end, like in the third age, for sure, at least the third age and probably the second age as well, Galadriel is sort of one of his primary opponents, you know, who mm. kind of thinks like this and is counter scheming him uh, uh, as they go. She becomes like she and Thurin Gwethel become almost like foils for each other. Right. Like that there, there's there has always been like a, a female counterpart who was, you know, uh, who was as subtle as he was in mind. Um, uh, and uh, and then there's Luthien. <laughs> and then there's Luthien. Right. Um, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, sorry for contributing to digression. No, it's, well, <laughs> this is an important, this is an important issue. I mean, and also, I mean, of course, in part, I have to admit to a little bit of like, I'm indulging in my final opportunities to talk about Thurin Gwethel because she's just, um, <laughs> she is of all of the lieutenants of Sauron. And I have loved Sauron's team. Like Sauron's yes. team has been one of my favorite things about the bad guys from the beginning. Um, and we're about to lose the last two members of Sauron's team. Like Sauron's dream team is gone uh, yep. in just a couple of episodes. Um and Thorin Gwethel has been one of the most fascinating developments. I mean, she's on the near the top of my list of characters that we've developed in some really fascinating ways that I really love uh, in film film. So um, for my money, we've succeeded in 
accomplishing one of our goals about Thur and Gwethel, which, which is that we wanted people to miss her when she was gone, uh, instead of only hearing about her posthumously, <laughs> as, as happens in, in, in the book. Um, yeah, but, um, yeah. Um, I, uh, no, I don't think Sauron will draw a map of Mordor on Finrod in this adaptation. Yeah, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm just saying. I don't think so. Yeah. Um, and if so, he'll put all the mountains in the right place. <laughs> well, you know, um, never mind. I'm not going to speculate about the level of detail one can achieve by carving onto people's flesh because that um, <laughs> doesn't even go through any intermediate stages before it's immediately very creepy indeed. So I was um, about to say, yeah, you don't want to reveal anything you might know on that subject. No, no. And I legitimately don't. So it's fine. Oh, Let's just not even go there. Oh, good. <laughs> Something you know nothing about. Something well I know done, nothing boy. about and I'm not really interested in knowing more about. So. Marie has, has actually been witness to the one time I've ever done any significant carving into human flesh. <laughs> yes, I asked. I drove you to the emergency room. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but uh, anyhow, okay. So um, I think as far as the Finrod, um, Finrod Sauron battle I think I'm good otherwise I liked um the, I mean the image of course the the imagery that we get from the from the poem is tell me more about um Ilana tell me more about the, uh, one thing that I could imagine as a reaction to this um you know so like a, imagining like uh you know indignant reddit posts the day after you know the the, the night that this uh that this that this episode of, of you know uh, uh, shows, um, I could imagine indignant Reddit posts about like why we didn't use the lines of poetry from the, which he not only wrote in the Lay of Lathian but then quotes in the Silmarillion. Um, well, I kind of did. Um, so uh, if you look, so so those lyrics are not lyrics they're not they're not lyrics to right. the song they're a description of the song of the song and the image. exactly so i pulled out all of the words right and uh so that i had a you know so that, so because I, I obviously i wanted to the song lyrics to reflect what was being described in the poem yeah but they're not lyrics so i, I turned them into lyrics by recasting it in a different poetic meter mm -hmm. in part mm -hmm. and um but trying as much as possible to tack to the imagery that yeah. uh tolkien actually and the words that yes. tolkien actually yeah in, in there so yeah. i was you know that was that was the idea yeah yeah no i agree i mean it is that seems to me a very sensible response to that objection, right? If people did, if anyone, anyone who did make that objection to say that, that they're not going to quote that poem. That is a poem about their song. It's not their song. It's, yeah. it's not the greatest song in the world. It's just a tribute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, Wait a while, uh, make that joke again. <laughs> and in the, um, in the uh, discussions that I had with Phil Menzies, who's, composing music to it yeah um you know i was imagining a kind of you know something like an a, an opera form not a rap battle form right <laughs> so that the, the lyrics don't need to be very wordy either because um you have long phrases of singing and 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 phrases can be repeated and and so on and played around with like you do in an in an operatic for, right. form um and that way you can try and weave in, you know, duet and and uh, we're going to, you know, we're trying to play around with that. So um, that I wanted to not, I wanted to be relatively sparse as well with the lyrics uh, right. and not, not public, right. which also like it's pretty, it's chutzpah anyway to try and yeah. like write lyrics to, to it's this true. anyway. It's true. It's true. <laughs> How dare you? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, I kind of felt that in the back of my mind. It's like, what yeah. am I doing? Just you, the the ghost of Professor Tolkien sitting <laughs> on your shoulder, scowling into his pipe. Yes. Yeah. 
I hear that. I hear that. I've I've been there. (laughs) Yes. Yes. But that's the challenge of adaptation is to take what's there and create something that fits and is good and has the same evocative meaning that you're Mm -hmm. hoping for, but not necessarily the exact same phrases or Mm. yeah, yeah, because it, the, poem isn't what Finrod and Sarn were saying to each other it's just yeah. not yeah it's, it's just, just a tribute it's well and it's also it's a sum up of it well yeah like, you've got the backward you know backwards and forwards with the song so yeah. there's a sense it, and I thought but it can be the same line repeated it doesn't right. have mm-hmm. to be different lyric each time right. so I have mm-hmm. those two lines the trust is broken trust is unbroken lines that are should metrically work together yes uh so that was that was how i tried to so they should be able to sing it at each other at the same time and it sound good yeah yeah um yeah no i like that and and even the 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 non-varying nature of those repetitions at the end i like that because if you do vary it it almost implies that like the magic lies in the word choice. Like if I, if I, if I phrased it differently, maybe it'll work this time or, you know, maybe it will give me the edge. And that's not the point at all. Like the the repetition really emphasizes the words are a vehicle of the will, but it's all about the conflict of wills uh, between them. Um, uh, Plus another thing that I kind of like is, um, the conflicting repetition is very discord of Melkor esque as well. Right. Um, and the way in which the beautiful song and the beautiful imagery of Finrod is by the end dissolving into, um, you know, uh, the clamorous repetition of a single note is that works like it's, you know, we're, we, there is a certain recapitulation of, you know, the music and the discord, um, except the discord wins here. Right. Uh, oh. at least locally, at least at this, at, at this moment. So anyway, I, that was the other thing that I liked about the repetition that I thought was pretty, uh, that I thought was pretty cool. Um, uh, yeah. Um, and it's okay. And they don't have to rap. It's fine. Like they're not Vanyar anyway. The Vanyar are the rappers, so um, uh, the that you know it would be yeah. natural for them not to use that medium. Although at the very beginning, it starts out as a spoken word. It does start, but that's recipe. Yes. Right. I, 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 right. It's it's it starts off more spoken than yeah. sung. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So that there's something to build to. So there is the slightest little. Reference. It's okay. Well, no, like I said, it's it, the Vanyar and Manway. They're the rappers. M- Manway mm-hmm. raps, but n- n- everybody else doesn't have to rap, so it's fine. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Clearly, Manway raps. That's almost explicit in the text, I thought. Mm. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. Music of words, man. It's all about the music of words. Um, okay. <laughs> Let's move on. <laughs> We're running out of time. Who on? We got to talk about who on. We have, you talked yeah. about who on in the Hound of Balinor. Uh, Not that I think lots of time spent on the song battle is inappropriate in any way, but let's talk about who on. Um, who on as the as the pretty much as the POV character for the Luthien segment uh, is really uh, is 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 very cool. My favorite thing. Um, which I wasn't necessarily, I, I was slightly surprised. It was one of those things like I was slightly surprised by it. And as soon as I noticed that, I'm like, I shouldn't have been surprised by that. I, anyway, I liked the re-emphasis on um, his bond with Keligorm, right? Like we had some, we had some tender moments between Huan and Keligorm uh, at the beginning of this episode. And I thought that that was a good reminder. Um, I think that that's important. Now, of course, there's a danger. Like we have to be careful lest the break look too sudden. Um, I, I, mean, I hear you. It yeah. was, it was, uh, that was tricky. Um, yeah. And in the end, I thought it's really about who on making a positive choice to help Luthien than yes. him 
making a choice to to go against Kelegorm, although he is assisted a bit by Kelegorm's clear um, lack of empathy. Right, right. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, so because he's got to go back to Kelegorm, so you know, it's exactly it's not, it's not a break. It's not a final break. Yeah. This is yeah. a, I'm going to help Luthien, and then I'm going to go back to Kelegorm. The other thing that I was wondering. So here was a parallel that occurred to me while I was reading it. And I was wondering if we could actually perhaps lean into this a little more. I don't know, I don't know how, but um, he, he, here was a parallel that occurred to me. Huon's rebellion from Kelegorm in this episode is kind of like Luthien's rebellion against Thingol in the previous episode. Luthien feels the pressure of destiny. Right. This is what should happen. This is what I should do. Now, she's she's in a dilemma of sorts. Right. On the one hand, there is her father and her kings clearly expressed wish, right? Very plainly expressed wish that she not go. But yet she feels that the, you know, loyalty and devotion that she owes him both as father and king is outweighed by the fact that this is fate. This is her fate. This is what must happen. He is wrong uh, to attempt to keep her from this. Wrong even if good intentioned in some ways, right? Like in, in as much as he is motivated by her own protection, it's more than that. This is Thingol at his jerk nadir, right? But but nevertheless, there's still, there's even there, he's not evil. I mean, there are still good motivations there, um, which she would see and respect, but she does not obey them. Nevertheless, and so she rebels against Thingol, not because he's horrible and not because she thinks he's evil, right? I mean, you know, she's not like rejected him. She's not cast him out. She's just said, I've, I've got to do what's right, despite the fact that this person um, whom I love and whom I have, you know, twofold duty to both as daughter and as subject says I shouldn't. I'm going to defy him anyway, because it's under these circumstances the right thing to do. Huon is in a kind of parallel position there, right? where Kelegorm, like Thingol, is not acting right, is being led by other desires to do the wrong thing. Um, wait, what was that? Sorry, I, I was thinking, I mean, but Thingol has sent her, <laughs> sent her, her bow off. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, He's the, done wrong. As a, yeah, so both of them, both of them are in the wrong. Both Kelgorm and right. Thingol are in, are in the wrong. Has, right. Yeah, um, and both Luthien Kel and Huon Kelegorm are going to perceive that. I see it's seeing Kelgorm the same way as Thingol here. Yeah. No, it's not. Well, yeah, because the parallel isn't exact. But I'm just thinking as far as their relation, like. Mm. Huon, Huon also has a twofold duty to Kelgorm as his friend and his yeah. master as prescribed by Orome. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. in neither case, like when Luthien runs away, clearly defying Thingol's will and doing exactly the thing that he was not wanting to happen, right? So Huon is going to defy Kelgorm's will and do yeah. exactly what he knows to be contrary to Kelgorm's will. Right. By by uh, by not only allowing Luthien to escape, but by helping her to escape. So he is directly undermining. Well, off quite. Yeah. And, and the, the, the way in which I found the parallel helpful is that. This does not have to be a moment where Huon is like. I repent of my service of Kelegorm. Him whom I have loved and served all of these years, I now suddenly think is evil and I'm done with him. I'm over him. I'm over Caligorm. I'm on to Luthien now, right? Um, that, would be, that would be a bad look, right? But it doesn't have to be that. Any more than Luthien is like, well, my dad is evil and I hate him now. Like, that's not her attitude towards Thingol, right? He's wrong. He's in the wrong. She's defied his will and would do it again. Um, but, uh, but, She's not, you shouldn't hate him. Like she's, you know, he's, he's still her dad. Right. And, and that's still kind of who on and Kelegorm. Like he doesn't, he doesn't condemn him. He's not like you've gone, uh, you know, there will come a moment when that break will happen, but it, but it's not yet. And so we still have a little more time yeah. than it might feel like to kind of build up to that. And I, so that's another reason why I liked 
making sure that we frame the beginning of this episode with the real bond between Kelgorm and Kurin, the real mutual affection between Kelgorm uh, and 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 Hurin. And Hurin starts being very enthusiastic about Kelgorm potentially having Luthien as a you know like he's he's all, he, he's um, approving of it up to yeah. a point what's not to um, like <laughs> yeah exactly but we, so so we've got this the scene where huon speaks to luthien and he mentioned i have him mentioning that he is he acknowledges that he's defying the will of his master yeah uh then, um do you, are you suggesting that we make it i make it a bit more explicit about what's going on there to I, I, parallel yeah. better with i'm Bingo, not sure or? again i I'm, I'm vaguely it. suspecting that the parallel could help to frame who wants choice, right? Mm. That if we make it, so, and I don't know how, I don't know if we make it totally explicit in his words, but if we make it clear that who wants sneaking out with Luthien is very like Luthien sneaking out of Doriath against breaking Thingol's express command and will, um, that might, it, it, just, it might help to understand because so either it's either it's going to the the, the the sort of twin dangers right are that first it feels weird for Huan to be like oh yes we've served together since you know before the 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 darkening of Valinor but goodbye I'm on the Luthien now like I I met a cute girl and I'm all over her now so forget you Caligorm I'm out right that would be weird and we don't want that but also similarly at the same time his going back to Caligorm could seem weird. Right, like oh, I totally betrayed you and everything, and I upgraded from you to Luthien, but I'm back. Everything's cool now, right? I mean, that that could feel weird too, right? In, in lots yeah, of ways. Because I, I, I was thinking of, I mean, you know, Huon is has been with Kelagorm since before, not just before the darkening of Valinor, but through the kin slaying and through the you know through the the yeah. curse and, and and all of that he's he's been through a lot with Kelagorm yeah and stayed true to the Feanorians so i figured there was kind of a bit of Feanorian pride in Huon's personality there has to be, have been right. for him to have you know wanted to stay so long with Kelagorm and and with the Feanorians and he's been perfectly content to do so up until now so but i agree he's he's hard. maybe getting to be more or less done with Kurafin. Yeah. With Kurafin, he, yes. Yeah, he knows that Kurafin's influence on Kelagorm is not doing good things for Kelagorm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And he's tried to express his objection to that. At a few that we points. were building yeah. into last season. Yeah. yeah. Last season yes. and currently into the season as well. So yeah. that so, is present, but that's his yeah. loyalty to Kelagorm coming out. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So here is you know he knows that Kelagorm's infatuated with Luthien, and even even though he knows this, he's going to help Luthien accomplish what Luthien wants. Yeah. Um, and uh, and knowing that this is not what Kelagorm would want. Yes. And uh, that's th that's got to be a tough choice at some level for him, but. On the other hand, he feels. It, I mean, I agree with you, Corey. He feels it strongly. This is the right thing to this do. This is the right thing to do. Yeah, not just because, like, he can perceive. Although he is, as you say, there's no downside to the idea of his master and Luthien getting married. What could be better, right? Um, but he perceives that Luthien is not into him, right? Um, and Caligorm is in a state of self-delusion and arrogant pride in which he believes that like either she'll come around or her father will agree or whatever like you know he's not regarding her will in this um and perceive so 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 the the two elements that would lead to Huan's choice one is perceiving that right that his master is not in fact honoring Luthien's will um, and therefore is doing wrong. But again, I think the other thing is an almost Melian-esque perception of what should be, right? Of the fact that yeah. this is what is fated, that this is... Um, yeah. and, and Luthien says that herself. In yes, what of exactly. His... Yeah, no, that's yeah. exactly what I was, uh, what I was thinking about, that he is, that he, that he, he hears that. He's moved by that. And Ilana, even his speech seems to echo that, right? I mean, 
his using one of his three speech tokens, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on this moment is is like yeah. his way of stamping like, yes, this is this is a moment of destiny. I am. That I am was another thing. Yeah, he I'm did, giving my verbal he, canine stamp of approval on the fact that this is this is a this is a, a moment of destiny here. And uh, that was that was because the other question is why does he choose to speak then? Because in theory, he could actually come up with the cloak and you know like he could communicate what needs to be communicated to help Luthien out of Nagathrond. Yes. But I, you know, so why speak? Why speak? <laughs> you know exactly. And, and I think yeah. that's that's why it's more than that. It is actually, I think I've been vaguely aware of this, but I don't think I've ever actually formulated this thought. But, you know, Huan speaks three times. In almost none of them is it important for plot reasons, right? Like, (laughs) you'd think, like, at least one of the three times he would speak would be like, look out behind you or something like that. Right. Like, you know, like a moment when words are essential and like he is gifted with the ability to speak, but all three of the times he's like times when I want to have a significant chat with you. Right. And they're never at times of tension. I mean, like we need to escape from, they're always at like quiet moments in a sense, you know, uh, like saying goodbye. Right. Um, you know, which is not uh, anyway. I, I I I think it's interesting that it suggests that the significance of Huan's speech, it's not that he is being granted the power of speech for practical reasons, right? Um, there are other reasons than mere I need to convey verbal information, and so I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity. You know, the only one that's even close to that is number two when he's talking about going to Angband. Um, mm. but even there, like, I'm not even sure that that's like <laughs> necessary from a plot, but he's giving them advice, right? Like, I want to, I want to give you advice. I want to, I want to tell you about stuff, but it's not but like Uncle Huan tell you some things, <laughs> right? Ex- it's more exactly. It's more like an avuncular advice yeah. session rather than like, okay, let me give you directions, <laughs> right? Or something like that, right? Something <laughs> practically moving the plot forward like his words don't move the plot forward ever at any of the three times do they move the plot forward they're just moments they're significant moments um i once had somebody ask me why he never in all that time never spoke to to keligorm it's like well keligorm doesn't like i don't think it's us that decided that keligorm understood the language of birds and of beasts i think that that was you know like it's he never needed to. <laughs> yes. Yes. He never needed to. Um, well, and that's, you know, when, when um, Kelegorm's talking about who on to Luthien when they're going to Naga, on the road to Nagathrond, he doesn't mention the speaking with words bit as no. one yeah. of the things that uh, yeah. who on. Uh, Which you would know, have like, been a little heavy handed had he had. Yeah. Yes. No, and, and, and here's another thing that I like about this. When Huan leaves Kelegorm and goes with Luthien, he's not switching masters. Right? Like, Kelegorm understands him. He and Kelegorm have this, like, he doesn't need to, actually, he doesn't need to speak in human speech. Kelegorm understands his canine speech, right? He's not going to have the same bond with Luthien that he had with Kelegorm. Like, he's not going to be Luthien's dog in the same way he was Kelegorm's dog. When he is acting with Baron and Luthien, He's like acting like they're, he's like, I'm here to be an agent of fate in assisting you, right? I'm coming in. He's almost like a, you know, like a, like a fairy god dog coming into their story, (laughs) right? Um, Rather than, so it's not a matter of like, I've been a faithful dog of Calgorm, but now I'm going to switch and be Luthien's faithful dog. His relationship is totally different. Fairy god dog. I like that. I think I'm. I think I'm. I, I think I'm gonna stick with that. Um, that's more like his relationship with them. Anyway. Um, but uh, yeah. So it's totally makes complete sense that all of his destined words would have been saved for that moment. He didn't. Not only did he not need them in the sense of Kelgrom could understand him anyway. He didn't need them in this. He wasn't fulfilling his destiny. He was like living his life with Kelgrom. But he was his destiny is this moment. This is the moment he's been, you know, he's been waiting for. This is the moment of his of his story, 
right? Mm. Um, and and he's the one who finds Luthien. Yeah. In, yeah. Yeah. He, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, right now, um, uh, I Duckman is saying on Twitch, how is he going to express all these conflicting loyalties? He only gets to speak once at this time. It's true. Uh, Non-verbally is how he's going to have to buy necessity how he's going to have to do this and what i'm th the re thinking through all this stuff of course this is not about like giving who on more lines or anything of course we can't do that but um but rather just trying to think through how we're framing it you know and how we're setting up his his um uh his relationship with the different people um yeah so anyway what? i think yeah one thing which uh, may not be reflected in the script as much as it once was because I was mean to Alana and made her take out all her references to, to camera movements, um, but <laughs> the idea that every scene in which Huan finds himself is shot from his point of view. Right. Um, giving us to help understand that right. this episode is his story. Right. Um, now, and Huan being the size dog that he is, his eye level isn't as far below human no, eye level no. as like if this if my dog were the point of view character of this episode. <laughs> you have instance. a dog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, uh, what I like that is it, the, the 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 shift will be relatively subtle. I mean, it'll be yes. it'll be lower, but yes. not you know it's not going to be knee height um, or anything. No. So. No. I think I got around it by um, making the, you know, giving who on the vocalization and expression I, lot. I told you, I told you that there's, there's ways to do it. Yeah. 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 Um, yep. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. Um, how, how, how high off the ground is his head, by the way? If so Luthien can ride him, it can't be lower than like close to human shoulder height. Yeah, I mean, he's got to be at least, like, chest high. He's probably at my shoulder height. Let's put it right. that way. Yeah. Which means... Or maybe Marie's shoulder height. Yeah. To go a little bit. I was thinking of Marie's shoulder height, too. Yes. <laughs> so, all right. For the reference of everyone else, I'm 5'3", if that helps. <laughs> um, I'm 5'2", five, I'm five so... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's for anyone who needs to know where my I'm shoulders five, are. 5'7", so it's not, like... Yeah, but it is. Right. But my shoulders are quite close to the top of my head, and <laughs> proportionally for most people. Okay, yeah, yeah, I have short shoulders, I guess. Anyway, um, so real Irish Wolfhounds are quite large dogs. So yes. the the photo that's on the slide, I assume we're still on that slide. Yeah. Um, the hand that's on that dog is my hand. My sister took that photo. So that's not my dog. I met a dog and made my sister take a picture for you met a reasons. dog. Yes. Anyway, so <laughs> a real Irish wolfhound, like if you're petting them, their their shoulders are not that much lower. Like they're above my waist. Right. Is where the shoulders of that dog are. Right. So it, we're just enlarging him a little bit if we're putting his shoulder his head at my shoulder. Yeah. Height. And so long as Luthien is not a, a huge person, it would be very it's not it does it will not require a very great deal of her, her actress is taller than me, <laughs> but, right. um, but I think five, seven, five, eight or something. I don't think she's right. Right. Enormously um, huge. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, her writing on Huan is, um, uh, easy enough to arrange. I mean, so if we look at the Ted Naismith illustration that I have behind me here, the, the scale that he depicts, I would actually picture who on being a little larger than that. Yeah, no, that that dog cannot carry that person. Yeah, so if we look at um, Alan Lee's illustration, mm -hmm. uh, he has quite a large who on yeah. with Luthien sitting on him and, and, it, and he's the size of a horse. Yeah. So it makes sense that you could sit on him. But yeah, I, I wouldn't want to um, crush the poor Irish wolfhound who's trying to do this the, In most of the scenes where people are talking to Huon, well, mostly Luthien in this episode, Luthien is sitting or lying with his head on her lap or next to her anyway. So there's there's not many standing Huon. Right, uh, right. So it's where there's, where there's actual 
interaction going on like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, but just a, a regular non CGI Irish yeah. wolfhound could easily jump up and put their paws on your shoulders. Yes. Like, yeah, yeah. no problem. Oh, yeah. They could easily be head at your head height right. with the real dog. Right. Um, so the only thing we'd have to use the, you know, look, we have a little fake thing with a dog skin over it right is um for writing scenes because you wouldn't i mean i've got a i've got a greyhound and my greyhound could put her paws yeah. on me yeah. and the irish wolfhound's going to be bigger than that yeah i mean much I, much bigger yeah, yeah yeah exactly no i think that that would all that would all work very well um yeah yeah so so again when we're talking about the point of view of the camera and we're talking about like dropping the camera you know a foot or less basically uh yeah just a little bit just which is which is nice a, like that's like, a it's a nice subtle kind of point of view oh and then there's that photo yeah right. yeah this is kind of the the way i typically envision it but i think this is probably too big for uh for our show i think this is the upper limit i think if he was this big people would be wondering why doesn't kelgorm ride him all the time <laughs> yes right right yeah, a little smaller yeah. than that, but I agree. It's not too. It's not too exaggerated. It's a little bit exaggerated, but it's not too much. This is probably my favorite image of one, actually. Yeah, I forget yeah. Who, who this is from. Um. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, I'm finding. That I found this image in a Jeff Lasala article. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Um. Okay, so other characters, we've talked about some of these. We talked about Thorin Gwethel. I'm not going to take the excuse to talk about Thorin Gwethel more. Um, Draugluin, I did not talk about Draugluin, though he's going to die in the same episode as Thorin Gwethel. Um, Draugluin has always been, in my opinion, the most... Like, we've done less with his character among Sauron's lieutenants than any of the others. Tevildo was different and had his thing, right? Um... Uh, you know, throwing Grethel, of course, has always been important. There was another one. Who am I forgetting? Wasn't there another one? Tevildo. There was Tevildo, Draglu, and throwing Grethel. Was there another That's one? No. Okay. No, there was. I she mean, was kind Gorgal of. Gorgal isn't really yeah. no, around very long. It wouldn't be. Okay. But anyway, of them, Draugluin has always been kind of the least interesting, the least distinct character. That's why I thought we should get some lines in this episode before right. he died. Right. Right. Um, so he's kind of, especially for, um, especially for his, um, team, like on that team, right. Um, compared to the other people and uh, to compared to Sauron and the other member of uh, Sauron's other lieutenants, he's the most thuggish one of them. Right. Has always been my general impression. He's yes. not as thuggish as Gothmog, but again, like by local standards, he is one of the most thuggish of them. He's the, you know, he's the um, sort of the military commander of them. Tevildo was not a military commander, right? If Tevildo was like the, um, you know, I don't know what, like the sadistic secret ops commander right yeah. or you know leader and interrogator Thorin, yeah yeah and Thorin, right slash torturer and um uh and Thorin Gwethel was the you know spy master slash second in strategic second in command Draugluin mm -hmm. was the captain in the field essentially mm -hmm. right of them mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh <clears throat> so how do we L let me put this question about Draugluin a little bit more pointedly how do we want to set up Draugluin in this episode for next episode right so we've next been episode, setting up his rivalry with Huan yeah is yeah his next episode is fighting Huan yeah. naturally so what is happening in this episode is he's being given a a task where he's going to be in charge of invading brothel mm -hmm. when that when the time comes for that and so we see him kind of stepping into the role that Tevildo had right and looking at Theron Gwethel and being like I'm moving up in the world you're just the same as always right. uh so 
so we see a little bit of arrogance there from him yeah um so arrogance, i think it's something he needs to have if he's gonna go attack huan who just killed a bunch of werewolves right right so we're we're setting up the pride before the fall for him if that helps yeah yep yeah no i do i do like that um I also was using him as the way to bring up Sauron's plans for Brethel, which kind of show the strategic importance of Brethel for both sides. Yes. Um, yes. And it, so even though this is never going to happen because Drugluin's going to get killed and Sauron's going to get defeated next episode, at least it sort of sets up how strategically important that area is. What's and really interesting about that is not taking Brethel turns out to be Glaurum's downfall. Right. Um, it like it's in its canon, you know, it's mm. Tolkien <laughs> that the forest of Brethel is strategically important. Um, and that buffer zone created by Thingol matters. Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, it's it's <clears throat> not one hundred percent clear. Like it like it's not obvious, but it's there. Yes. Mm. And I like the fact also that we are showing, even in, in small, comparatively small ways, some of the impact that Baron and Luthien's story is having on the rest of the... I mean, the story itself doesn't emphasize, like, you know, the take-home from Luthien destroying Tall and Gaurhoth is not... Ah, and the strategic linchpin of that part of, uh, you know, Beleriand is now back in the hands of the good guys. Like, that is not where the story goes with that, right? And yet, it's that's still also true, right? That's it still does there. for us. I <laughs> know, it does for us. It is important to keep that in mind. And getting a glimpse of the fact that had this not happened, even had Kelgorm and Kurafin's plans to try to retake Tulsirion proceeded in the slow fashion that they were proceeding, Bretho was going to get destroyed. Um, mm. and that that would probably have happened. That would probably have worked. Brethel was going to get attacked. Was going to get attacked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I yeah, you know. Which yeah. you know does that bring you know the Sindar into the equation? Who knows? You know, yeah. like yeah, um, yeah. But I'm anyway, showing no that, that you know, <laughs> there's this whole further scenario of things that has played out. And even just showing Sauron's strength, you know, Sauron, Sauron asserting himself as this increasingly dominant Dark Lord presence who is really beginning, you know, really a threat to 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 be um, a powerful Dark Lord over this whole area. Um, certainly, there's a sense in which nobody else in Beleriand really is going to fully appreciate the threat that he is. They they understand the threat that having a bad guy in charge of Tulsirion poses, mm. but they don't really yet get the fact Sauron is now becoming a really big deal. And, you know, um, uh, and if he had not been taken down by Luthien, things might have gone very badly. Right. The idea that Sauron had his eyes on all of Beleriand as well yes. is something that the viewers know because we keep showing Sauron's plans getting co-opted by Morgoth along the way. Yes. But the elves of Valerian didn't know what he was up to. So yes. that, that's why well, we have I... to keep showing the villain side to, yep. to see what, what Sauron was. So I also made it very explicit that Sauron was looking for Nagathrond as well. Yes. Yes. Um, which he must have been. Must <laughs> have been. Just, yeah. yeah. Agreed. Um, if, Agreed. If he took Tal Syrian, that would be the next step down the Syrian. Yeah. Is to yeah. Uh, and certainly the the I mean, yeah, absolutely. Um it, it, and better than just saying, and next I shall attack Doriath. That's probably not the next item on your list. You bump that no, down the list, no. I think, a little bit. No, no, um he, so he's he's got Finrod in his sights. Yeah. Anyway. For sure. For Finrod sure. Finrod even showed that. Yeah. No, I think that, that seems exactly right. That seems exactly right. Um I love uh, getting to know some of Finrod's loyal companions um, who are who remain completely faceless in the book, oh. right? To be able to get a, a little bit of a chance to know some of the folks who are going to get devoured by werewolves in the next episode is good. Um, uh, I like that. Um, Oradreth, 
was really interesting. <laughs> I was really interested by the depiction of Aura Dreth. Um, and the way that Kelligorm and Kurifin were sort of manipulating him and using him, I thought was cool. I thought that was cooler than just having... Tolkien doesn't tell us much of like, the details of what's going on, but the vague impression that I get from the text is that Oradreth is sort of technically this sort of placeholder, but Kelgorm and Kurofin are absolutely running everything, and you know Oradreth is left kind of playing with toys in the corner while they actually do all the work. Depicting, I'm not saying that's what Tolkien is saying, but that, again, that's the sort of the impression that I'm left with. Um, I like the idea of showing they're not only keeping Oradreth theoretically in power to make things easier on themselves, but they're actually like using him and manipulating him in various ways. I, th I thought that was, I thought that was fun. I thought that and was I fun. also couldn't imagine a scenario where Oradreth didn't know that Luthien was in Nargothrond. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, so once, once that was the case, then he had to have some kind of reaction to it. Right. Uh, and then, then I thought, well, uh, you know, we thought that, you know, he would have the same reaction that Kelligorm and Kurufin originally had, which is we should send you home. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, it is her presence. Do, I mean, it does put people in a legitimate tight place. Right. I mean, it's it is, in fact, Thingol's will that she come back. Right. I mean, mm. it's it's um, if not for the fact that she's his daughter, it would be it would be like returning an escaped prisoner. It would be exactly returning an escaped prisoner, right? <laughs> um, so it's it's a little bit awkward to be like, "Hi, so we captured your daughter and held her against your will. I hope that's okay, but I think you know she was breaking your wills." I mean, that's awkward. Like, there's nothing not awkward about that. Um, mm. And Ordreth would feel that awkwardness, but what's he going to do? Am I going to? Am I going to being put in this awkward position where I have to choose between either what Thingol the King presumably wants and what Luthien explicitly wants? He's got to He's got to disappoint somebody. Right. Who's, who's it going to be? And it's probably not going to be Luthien. It's probably going to. You know, if, you know, he's probably not going to disappoint. I mean, the right thing to do as king would be to honor the will of Thingol, wouldn't it? Right. So, well, he, he's I mean, the, the least worst option from his perspective is to keep Luthien in Nargothrond because mm. she's safe there. She's not wandering off after Beren and uh, he's not sending her home either at that point. Right. So, so I think that was, you know, that was his kind of solution. Right. Uh, which is why he's, you know, the, the imprisonment of Luthien isn't really an imprisonment. It's more of. We're not going right. to aid you in, in, right. in getting you out. You stay here. We'll tell your dad yeah. where you are. Yeah. You, then we'll we can work it out. out. Yeah. Everyone yeah, else can work it out. Like, right. Yeah. He'll send somebody from Doriath and then it will become their problem. And I can just be like, I've I done right by was, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that, that was how I mentioned that too. Yeah. yeah. He's, he's not trying to start a war with Doriath. And it's not entirely clear what. Thingol's will is because it's not like Luthien showed up with a letter saying my dad kicked me out. <laughs> right. Or like in, you so, know, striped prison pajamas or something like that. Right. Yeah, yeah. But she did show up by herself saying that she's chasing Baron. And that's um, suspicious. It's, that, that's, it, that sounds sketchy, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So something's up. And yeah. obviously this is not an official delegation from Thingol. <laughs> yes. That, yeah. she sh that she's traveling alone right off the mm. bat. Like there's no there's no way that that's it's weird. okay. It's well, weird. even Caligorm and Kurifin's first response is, let's escort you home. You know, that's... Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, it's yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I uh, I kind of like dopey Caligorm. Like, that was kind of fun. Like, the uh, dopey love struck Caligorm. Um, mm. Even just as an opportunity to show, like... Um, He's not all bad. Right. I mean, there's there is some good in his response, in a sense, or at least understandable in his response, though, you know, the fact that he is combining his obvious attraction to her with an equally obvious disregard for her will uh, is not there's, a good look. There's a lot of nice guy syndrome going on there. Like he was nice to her. And so he should, you know, get treated 
nicely in response. Yeah. Nicely. Yeah. No, he's not, but he's not AOL either. I mean, no, you know. no, no, no. But so, and, I would and, definitely and, contrast our depiction of Kelegorm with our depiction of Dairon. Um, right. yeah. and, and the way that Dairon's plot well, arc ends up. Genuine respect for Lucian. Right. And, and he, so. he helps her. Yeah. He That's helps actually, her yeah. he, with no expectation of something coming back to him in return. The, yeah. the model I had for Kelegorm was uh, Godfather, Michael Corleone, getting uh -huh. thunderstruck. Right, uh, right. Yeah, the, the thunderbolt. Thunderbolt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that was that was what I had in, in mind. Yeah. At least in the actual scene. Yeah, that, that parallel with Dairon really helps me, Nick, actually, yeah. thinking about, like, there are these, because there, there are two other men who are in some sense or to some extent in love with her, right, who are going to be essentially mm -hmm. disappointed suitors and to have them be sort of foils for each other in how they act upon being disappointed uh, is very telling, I think, um, and a useful parallel. Yeah, because everyone who meets Luthien loves Luthien. That's right. just the nature of Luthien. Yes. The question is, what does that look like? And mm. some people are very possessive or yeah. self-centered in their yeah. love. And some people are much more selfless and other-centered. And Huan, very other-centered, right? He's yes. doing things for Luthien, for the good of Luthien. Thingol, very possessive. Like, yes, he loves his daughter, but quite possessively. And that's not okay. So Kelegorm is more on the possessive side of things with yes. Thingol. Um, and then there's Morgoth. But... Right. Uh, yep. I, don't, I don't know if I could even use the word. I think I think love Caligorm to describe that. <laughs> Caligorm's also just totally self-centered. Yes, yeah. exactly. Uh, and yeah. that's uh, where he would get possessive, I suspect, if a relationship were to develop. But I don't think we get that far. Even. Well, we just get the self-centeredness. Here's him. the yeah. other fun thing that I'm not sure we couldn't lean into just a tiny bit later on with Caligorm's character when things get really ugly with Caligorm towards Luthien later on. Like when the fine oh. day comes that he's starting to shoot her with arrows, for instance. Right. Oh. Um, the parallel between Luthien and the Silmarils themselves. Right. If I can't have them, no one can. Well, I'm just saying, like, I often I often do this comparison in reverse, actually. Um, not compare Luthien to the Silmarils, but compare the Silmarils to... Uh, the, the, actually, the, the, the image that I always have is, um, is a really geeky one. It's Florimel from uh, Edmund Spencer's Fairy Queen. Um, the, the point is... The Silmarils, sometimes I hear people talk about the Silmarils as if the Silmarils themselves are like evil, like that. Look mm -hmm. at all the suffering that the Silmarils bring about. And the point is not that the Silmarils are bad. The point is that they are the ultimate objects of desire. They are just beautiful. They are the ultimate objects of it is the desire of others. The problem is people are bad. People are the problem. Exactly. Yes. And yeah. so in, in, in Spencer's Fairy Silmarils Queen. Silmarils don't kill people. People kill people. Exactly. Uh, in, in books three and four of Spencer's Fairy Queen, Florimel is the, she's the most beautiful woman ever. She's, you know, she, she's not Luthien because she's a one, like a one dimensional character. But anyway, she is like, her job is to be the most attractive woman ever. And what does she spend all, and 100% of her time is spent running away from people who are trying to rape her. Like every scene, she's like, she's like just literally galloping away from people who are, sometimes it's like ogres who are pursuing her, trying to like eat her and or rape her. And sometimes it's men and so, and who are trying to take her and marry her by force. But she, she is, she's an object of, she's a wandering object of like ultimate object of desire. And she's like a touch point for people to like, like it, it tells you about their characters when they come into contact with her. The Silmarils are like that, right? Like you can have, there's nothing ba bad about them, but your desire tells something about you. Luthien is similar. Like she has, she, there, there's a kind of parallel there between the two of them. And so since we're, it's Kelgorm and Feanorian, some element, some at least kind of like hint or echo of the oath, right? Um, 
his atti- if his attitude towards her should in some ways, I think, kind of evoke the kind of possessiveness that Feanor demonstrated in his oath at first. Um, anyways, I, I think that's something we could kind of lean into a little bit, like not too heavily, but a little bit later on. Um, but, um, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, Lord Telperion says Helen of Troy. Yes, similarly in that Helen of Troy. I mean, yeah, uh, in in many ways, yes. Um, uh, there's still at least like um, there are men who meet Helen of Troy who don't try to take her away. But 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 yes, she's the she's the the object of desire and the point of contention. Um, but uh, but yeah yeah no I I think that's that's exactly right. Um, I like the we got only got a brief bit with Dairon here, but Dairon's desire to be part of the uh, even the um, the like Thingol's kind of patting of Dairon on the head, like, uh, you know uh, thanks, I'm glad you want to help but um, I thought instead of assigning this to somebody competent um, was uh, <laughs> was kind of touching um, a, a touching setup for you know, Dairon in the wild later on um, uh in over his head, but in o- over his head out of, you know, um, a devotion and a desire to set things right, I think was 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 nice. And yeah. the only one who has enough respect for Luthien to 100% believe that she's going to go all the way to Ang Ban. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I like that. I like that. Um, yeah, and then we talked about... <laughs> Gil Cowards, uh, who is clearly ready to quit the whole ambassador gig because this is for the birds. <laughs> I do not get paid enough for this. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. He's going to have a I, long, I have hard a talk with his father when he gets back, clearly. I did have a question about that scene. I originally wrote it with uh, from Caligorm, and then I, at, at uh, actually, it was after the script discussion of episode five. Mm-hmm. I thought this is not the sort of thing Caligorm would do. Right. So I wrote, rewrote it from as Kurofen as the writer of the letter and representing his brother. Yeah. Did that work better for for you as well. I, um, it certainly worked better for me in a couple of ways. I I do think, in one sense, it's hard to imagine Kurofen being like, oh yeah, I'm going to let Caligorm write this letter. Right. Yeah, like, that was, I mean, I had a with that too. seriously, like he's yeah. I don't think he trusts Caligorm to be that smart. I mean, he wants to be in control of this political situation. I originally right. I thought that Caligorm, no, Kurofin wrote the letter, but wrote it in Caligorm's voice. But then right. I thought, no, he probably didn't want to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Besides, the other thing that I liked about it is that it, it seemed to establish. If you are writing a letter like that to Thingol in your own name, you are taking the posture of a petitioner to Thingol. Yes. If you are writing it on behalf of someone else, then you are establishing, you know... You're a, a matchmaker. Yes, yeah. between two parallel... Like, it's basically paralleling, like, there's Thingol and Caligorm, and I'm arranging, you know, an alliance between you and my brother Caligorm. Um, it's much better than, like... Hi, Thingol, can I please marry your dog? Like, I'm asking for your blessing to marry your daughter. Like, that is not the foot that Cal- that Kurofin yeah. would want to put forward in that relationship. So for that reason, politically, it that seemed to work better it. in that yeah. way, for that reason as well. That's good. Yeah. And naturally, I wanted the Feanorians to have, like, a point to what they were trying to do and not just be like, how can we be complete jerks in this situation? Because right. they oh. are jerks, I get it. But... Yeah. Kurofin does have political ambitions here. So and they have to have a realistic idea in their head that this could work. And Thingol's the one who named the Silmaril as the bride price. Mm. That involves yeah. them and interests them. Yeah. 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 So like this is not necessarily showing what would have happened if Kelogorm's plan had worked out, but it's it's showing Thingol some of the consequences of his actions. Yeah. And they don't and they don't I mean Thingol bans the Feanorians from ever setting foot in Doriath and won't have anything to do with them. But precisely because of that, it wouldn't be clear to Caligorm and Kurofin precisely what Thingol's mindset is about this. Yeah. Um, and uh, so approaching and going, look, we've 
kept your daughter safe and my brother's fallen in love with him and you've named a Silmaril as the bride price and is Let's Silmaril talk about the, that. Uh, right, right. <laughs> so, you know, this 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 makes sense and you know, we've got mutual and so I sort of drew on, you know, we're we're descendants of the elder line of Finway, who's your friend, and you know, um, you know, sort of drawing on on the good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, since... and thinking that, that there's, there's, you know, it's plausible that they would think that this wasn't, they weren't doing it just to be um, cheeky. Right. I mean, Their end goal is not to, to tick Thingol yeah. off. Like they're no. not just trying to make no. him angry. And, but at the same time, since you seem to be interested in giving your daughter away in exchange for him a Silmaril, why didn't you come and talk to the people to whom the Simrils actually right. belong? Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, it is that that is a really fun note in the letter, right? To say, okay, you know, um, you you're the one who's put yourself in the wrong, Thingol. Yeah. Right. Um, we can make this right. We exactly, yeah. exactly. We can still patch this up, though. We're being magnanimous here, right? Yes. <laughs> Notice how we haven't just attacked you. Right, right. Um, for naming the Silmaril well, in design, or, or killed that your was... daughter, who we found helpless in the woods. Yeah, yet <laughs> so we haven't attacked you. <laughs> yes. Yet, exactly, exactly. It's still and early then, in the day. And we yeah. don't actually get to the end of the letter. So. Yeah, right. and they don't There's actually get to the end of the letter. Yeah, yeah. Well, the camera, and... the camera man can't like just doesn't have the heart to watch Gilgal go through that. It doesn't, like, it gets <laughs> yeah. too awkward. Yes. But there's uh, gonna be another letter sent to Dior. Ooh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And then they will attack. So right. yeah. like this this letter is meant to be a little bit more lighthearted and funny because of the fact that nothing ha comes of it yet. Yeah. But yeah. But also if I mean, you know, if Thingol says sure, right? <laughs> right. Good idea. <laughs> um and uh, I mean then that's kind of like him naming the Silmaril as a bride price is you know, it's it, it's it's cheeky on the part of Thingol from the Fanorian's perspective because it's you know like we don't have to give you a Silmaril, but you know we can, um, you know, we if, if, if Caligon's married to Luthien and yeah. we have a Sil, you know, we have a Silmaril, then that kind of fulfills it, doesn't it? You know, right, right, yeah, yeah, you know, and the thing, the thing that is. That I also like the, especially the kind of the naming of the titles and the, you know, the eldest line of Finway and, and that kind of thing. Um, one of the other things that I liked about that was, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to just, you know, diss Kelgorm and Kurafin. But the fact is, Luthien's got to marry somebody, right? Um, from their perspective, doesn't have to. She doesn't have to. No, but I mean, but seriously, like from a political <laughs> but point yes, of view, yes. right? She's the only child of Thingol. She's yes. the only child of Thingol. This is there's an obvious political opportunity here, right? Name better I mean, candidates. That's to be honest. Who are more eligible um, bachelors in Beleriand than mm. Kelagorn? I mean, like, give me. It's a short list if there's a list, right? Um, and and certainly, if you enter into the Kel the the Feanorian viewpoint, you know there's almost nobody uh, who. I mean, it's this actually makes sense from their point yeah. of view, right? I mean, it's not a political marriage between Thingol and. I mean, we know how Thingol feels about the Feanorians, so we know it's absurd on that level. But from a purely like political standpoint, mm. there's nothing absurd about it. Marriages right. between. Well, I'd say Magdalene that are that <laughs> marriages between groups that are diametrically opposed are quite common. Yeah. In in history. Yeah. Like that's how you fix it. That's how you fix it. Like yeah. that's that's the, why... that's the last ditch attempt to fix it before there's a war. That's why one mm. of the old English kennings for woman is peace bringer. Mm. 
<laughs> that's what it means. That's why. That's why they call them that, because um, you can you can marry them off and make peace between warring peoples. Um, it's, that's um, sometimes. Sometimes but, it doesn't always pan out. I know. Like sometimes yeah. that I, I would think. Although, I would think um, Maglor and Lucian would be probably a better match. Well, I'm not saying like what that they would be the ideal match. I'm just saying from a political to standpoint, be there on the ground, you know. Right. <laughs> and to be fair. I'm not sure we see very many political marriages among the elves. No, no. So despite that being part of human history, it is well, still, yeah, it's not how elves do this. Right. And no, it's clearly deviant, but it's, but it's yeah. deviant in a way that at least makes sense. Right. right. That's all, all I wanted was for it to yeah. make well, sense in the context in this of the case, story. Because Kelligorm has fallen in love with Luthien. I mean, there's a, you know, mm -hmm. like there has to be a love element to elvish marriage. Yeah. That's quite, Clear. Yeah, right. Doesn't right. matter how how royal you are. Um, and and Kurfin isn't going to bring up in the letter. Now, of course, Luthien doesn't feel the same way about Celeborn, right. so and we to, may have yeah. to lean her a little on her a little bit. But yeah. and to be perfectly fair to Celeborn, they haven't really. She hasn't really had the chance to make her wishes explicitly known about their. I mean. He is still that they are still at the very early stages of their acquaintance, where at the very least it's easy enough for him to deceive himself into thinking that she is going to come to love him. Um, I mean, he has no concrete reason to think that that's impossible, especially no, from the Baron, point of view of, of an infatuated dead person. Either way. I huh? mean, Baron's a, Baron's dead shortly anyway. Yeah. from his perspective, right. whether <laughs> one way or the other. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Give him fifty um, years, and he's he's gone. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it, it's, you know, he's got time to wait. So it's not, that's not a, an issue. Yeah. Um, the letter comes when it does because a letter needs to be sent to Thingol. Uh, and yeah. uh, so that's, that's why it comes at this point. Otherwise, I'm sure they would be quite happy to just wait and have Luthien hang out in Nagathron for some time. Yeah, but that, yeah, it's not going to work that way. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah. So I. Yeah. It, also, it's not hard to understand how neither Kelgorm nor Kurafin would see Baron as a legitimate rival. Mm. Right. Even for her affections. Mm. Really. Um, like it's 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 not hard to understand them not really taking that seriously. Essentially. No. They did see how highly Finrod thought of Baron. Yeah. In the last episode, obviously. Yeah. So and they met the guy. So they realize that he's a human of interest. Right. But not of interest to the Princess of Doria. No, and, and not, I mean it's I mean, just think <laughs> about the I mean back to the Athrobath, right? I mean it's just like mm. that's it's kind of like more or less off the table, right? I mean, it, I mean, or again, one could be forgiven, especially to someone in Calgorm's situation, for thinking that way, right? Um, and um, and yeah, you know, we're talking about that his desire for her and his actions towards her are deviant within elf culture in some ways, but also to him, her desires have to look deviant. Right. She's the one who needs help, obviously. She's right. in love with this mortal schmo, right? Like, if Something somebody needs, needs like, counseling yeah. to come back to the way of the Eldar, it's Luthien. Right? I mean, come on. Mm. Seriously, right? I mean, like, uh, again, especially if one were even a very slightly arrogant um, Feanorian elf, one, one can easily get oneself into, you know, into that point of view. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um... Okay. All right. Well, it's late, so we should we should uh, we should it probably is, I wrap hardly up. Hardly notice. <laughs> yes, we should probably wrap up. Um, we do have our next episode um, on in two weeks on Thursday, January fifth. Um, so our, our our scheduled off week falls neatly uh, right in uh, the post uh, Christmas week, when, which is when I'll be traveling. So, um, but we should be able to be back and. Uh, 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 be together again on January 5th. Um, and the next script discussion, you guys are up to episode 12 now, um, and that's going to be on the 13th of January. So that'll be after the next episode. Yep. Right. So you guys are skipping a skipping a, a, a script discussion for the holidays? Or is that just when the next one was scheduled anyway? 
Yes. Sure. Yes. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So Friday the 13th at 8 p.m. Eastern time uh, mm -hmm. is the next script discussion to talk about episode 12. Um, ooh, episode 12. That's the Mandos episode, yeah? Nope. No, that's 13. It's Hunt for the Wolf. Hunt for the Wolf, right. Okay, there we go. Excellent. Um, Who on the last stand? Yeah, there we go. There we go. Okay, excellent. All right, so that'll be that'll be fun. Looking forward to that. Um, Ilana, thank you for your work on this. This is a lot of... I know... I mean, there are a bunch of episodes this season. This whole season, there's kind of a lot of pressure on. Um, but I know that there were elements... The Finrod Sauron song battle plus one of Huan's three speeches both fell in this episode and that's that's a lot of responsibility so I, I appreciate your uh, your your taking that on and I thought you did a great job so thank you for your for your wonderful work on this script thank you it is a team effort yeah very much so. <laughs> yeah that's fantastic um, excellent and to, and thank thank you all for uh, for listening and for uh, joining in with us um, do we know what we're doing at the next session yet Marie are we doing the next episode or are we doing something uh, else in between? Casting, question mark? Casting, possibly? Okay. Yes. All right, we're going <laughs> to... I don't know, it's next year. <laughs> it's next year. I know, it's so far in the future, we'll see. We'll, we'll, be, doing, we'll be doing something in two um, weeks. Okay, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll make sure we have a plan for that. And we'll let you, and we'll let you know, we'll let you guys know then. Phenomenal. All right, thank you everybody. And I will say as always, thanks for listening and Godspeed.